Coming up on One Central Florida. A behind the scenes look at dolphin care and training at a marine attraction near St. Augustine. Basically do a, a head to tail overview of each animal. Plus, winning in baseball is usually determined by who can hit the ball the hardest and run the fastest. But in one very special Central Florida League, heart is the only thing that matters. I'm a father and there is nothing more precious than seeing your kid having fun. Also, in Titusville, a World War II torpedo bomber is being restored to its flying glory. And it's not Africa, it's Lakeland. Ride along on a safari wilderness adventure. All that and more on this edition of One Central Florida. Dolphins, there's definitely something unique and wonderful about them. Marineland is a historical dolphin research, breeding, and tourist attraction hidden just south of St. Augustine. Kevin Roberts is the curator of marine mammals. I am more or less the specific animal care representative uh, overseeing the care of the animals. I'm a longtime animal trainer, but I've gone more into the animal care side of things in recent years. Here you go, Kiwi. On a daily basis, first thing in the morning, usually we'll do what we call morning rounds, just going around, taking a look at the animals, basically do a, a head to tail overview of each animal, uh, looking for any changes from the day before, uh, anything that, uh, that might be questionable at all, in any part of the body inside the mouth, the, inside the blowhole, uh, anything external on the animal's body. Then throughout the day, I'll also at random walk out and uh, watch any training sessions. The trainers do multiple sessions a day like this too, where it might be uh, nothing but fun stuff. It might be some exercise, like you see Dazzle about to go out and do some bows out there. Uh, and uh, all, we also do uh, just regular feeds where we'll just step right up and do nothing but feed the animals. There may be uh, what we call a free feed where they don't do any, we're not asking for any behaviors. We just step up and give them food, jello, what have you. But again, as you can see in the various sessions, so much of what the trainer interaction is and the reinforcement is with the dolphins is secondary reinforcement. The attention from the trainers, the tactiles, the, the hugs, the body rubs, all that kind of stuff. The care and training of dolphins at Marineland has gone through changes as the attraction itself has changed over its long history. Marineland first opened in 1938 as an underwater movie studio and our founders really looked upon three pillars on what they really founded the company on. Science and research, education, uh, the movie studio, and then uh, as a public attraction. And throughout the years, Marineland grew over time as the number one attraction in the state of Florida. Our business model really changed uh, in the late 90s and we knew that the shows was not something that was gonna support ourselves in the long run. And people's need for getting intimate and closer up with aquatic animals uh, was growing and growing. And so we switched the whole business model over to an interactive facility. Several facilities began experimenting with uh, training the dolphins how to interact with strangers in the water with them. And uh, throughout the 1990s and now uh, into the 2000s, we've seen that grow and grow to where we now have a situation where people can get in the water with the dolphins and it's just like you're being, almost like being a trainer. The dolphins know what to do. They're completely well trained. Marineland calls these experiences dolphin encounters, but its goal is more than just playing with dolphins. We love to use our animals to educate the public about bottlenose dolphins, about just ocean life in general. If we can strike a chord in all of our guests every single day to recycle, to help connect with ocean life, that's our main goal. I think they're just like really beautiful creatures and like, they just really need to be protected. It's wonderful that they can be here and they have like a really good life here. It's amazing. Very good. How was that one, Toko? I oh, was a wet kiss. <laughs> good girl. Marineland's historical breeding program is also an important part of its mission. So this is Coquina. 
our youngest dolphin. She's 15 months old now. She's in here with her mama and her grandma. Grandma Betty's in her late 40s and her mom Dazzle's in her uh, mid-20s. Coquina is another representative of the, uh, the world's longest bottlenose dolphin breeding program. Uh, Marine Land's been breeding dolphins since the 1940s. And as you can tell, she's a very precocious little kid. Enjoys human contact quite a bit. Roberts routinely uses ultrasounds to monitor the reproductive status of females. This is uh, Roxy's left ovary. You can kind of see the outline here with a bit of a ligament running through the middle of it. Uh, if Roxy were uh, going into estrous cycle, for example, we would probably be seeing some type of follicle appearing on one ovary or the other. Uh, in this particular case, everything looks calm, so uh, she's rather dormant at the moment. Research is also a big component of Marine Land's mission. And we just simply put it directly into the tail flukes. We've contributed to a number of research projects in the past three to four years. In recent years, we've begun to focus a little bit more on specific comparisons with dolphins under human care, where they're dramatically outliving their wild counterparts. Throughout his career, Roberts has developed attachments to the marine land dolphins, but that affection has limits. I've chosen to work with dolphins for, for as long as I have because I really do care about them, and I really can be a bit of a dolphin nut sometimes. Over the years, I've tried not to anthropomorphize dolphins too much, give them human qualities and characteristics and things like that. It's kind of difficult. People do it with their dog or any other animal they're close to on a daily basis. What we try to push here also is we want people to look at them and appreciate them as dolphins. Don't try to make them people of the sea. Don't try to make them, you know, miraculous, you know, healers of, of children and things like this. When you come to Marine Land to see our dolphins, we're glad you love them. We want you to love them for the right reasons. We want you to take the love for them and spread it out to the wild dolphins and support legislation that might be pending, uh, support healthy recycling habits, you name it. Welcome everybody to the 2015 Fall Miracle League season. All right, let's have a good day and have a great season. Our motto is if you can't play in a traditional baseball league, this is the league for you. No matter what your disability is, how severe or how little severe it may be. The rules to the Miracle League are very, very simple. Every child bats, every child hits, every child scores. We don't keep score because it's not important who wins. They're winners by just merely being out here, playing a game they've been told their whole life they can't play. The Miracle League is comprised of four teams. We play two games every Saturday morning, and we have approximately 50 kids total that play in the league currently. I love every, everything about the Marigold League and, and this is, it just gives me a great opportunity to make new friends and have fun. I'm a father and there is nothing more precious than seeing your kid having fun. Just to see the smile on her face when I tell her it's time to wake up on Saturday to play Miracle League is all you want to see. Like when, I, when I'm throwing and catching or pitching and batting, I'm in the zone. It's, it's a good feeling. It's an awesome feeling. So much fun. Tons of fun. It's a great feeling to know that he feels comfortable in what he's doing and he's not being judged. And it's a great feeling that he can and actually just come out and enjoy himself. 
It's an unbelievable feeling to have our children be part of this type of environment and this organization. Actually watching them play the game is secondary to me. It's when I see them when they come up from the parking lot and they're all giving me hugs and, and that means so much to me because they're like my own children. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. The secret to this league is not only the, the spirit of the, of the children, but it's, it's the buddy system that we have in place. We have able-bodied volunteers who will assist each player with as much or as little help as they want. It's the relationships these children build with these folks, even for an hour. Our children in the league all of a sudden have a new friend, and I see as big smiles in our buddies as I do our players, and they get so much out of it. The exciting part is to watch the smiles on the face. Our buddies feel like, man, we're special because we get to be the best sidekicks to these special needs kids. Yeah. 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 That was great. There is nothing like it. It's the most rewarding thing to know that they're having fun and we get to just help make that happen. It's great. It's so much fun and it's a great way to spend my Saturday morning. It's a real life baseball experience for these kids. You can tell it by looking in their eyes. When the kids are smiling, the parents are smiling too. I just love doing it because it gives me a, a blessing that, and so kind and blessed, it makes me feel special. I go home after every game and I always have some story to tell my wife. And when I just see their faces and I hear the stories of the parents about how their kids have been up all night because they're so excited about the game, and that means that we did something right. Coming up on One Central Florida, Return of the Avenger. A World War II airplane returns to the skies in Titusville. Also, a wilderness safari right here in Central Florida. But it's not in a big theme park. Rockledge is the oldest incorporated city in Bavard County. It lies along the Indian River banks. Rockledge has a lot of history, a lot of old families that have been around here for generations. We have a historical district. What I love about Rockledge is well, like right behind me here, the Indian River. I live just up the street about a block, and we went off on a trip this summer, my wife and I, and the first thing we missed was driving up and down on the river. It's one of the prettiest drives probably in Central Florida if you take your time and go from the south end to the north end. And a lot of people on the docks, a lot of people run on this road. They ride their bikes on it. It's a very great place to live. It's hometown. The Avenger, a World War II torpedo bomber instrumental in helping defeat the Japanese Navy. Initially developed for the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, it also saw action with several other Allied naval and air forces around the world. After the war, some were abandoned to aircraft graveyards, but many were put into civilian service. Today, only a few dozen TBM Avengers still fly. Here at the Valiant Air Command Museum in Titusville, volunteers are working to make one more Avenger airworthy. Our particular plane was built in 1945 in July, or that's when the Navy took it. It saw very little service, in fact spent most of its time in storage yards as far as we can tell. During the end of the war, there were several of these planes available and the forestry services took a lot of them and made water bombers out of them. And this one in particular did belong to the California Forestry Service. They took the Bombay doors off of it, installed the water tanks, and they used it for fire spires. This particular plane was, at some point after that, was transferred to the Georgia Forestry Service, and they used it to spray bugs. 
There's a museum in northern Georgia that had the airplane, and it sat pretty much outside for a number of years, unused. The first decision that had to be made was whether to make the Avenger a static display or restore it to fly again, a much more costly proposition. We did start the engine because that was the turning point as to what we're going to do with it. A rebuilt engine for a plane like this will run anywhere from $40,000 to $60,000, and that's a start. So knowing that we had a good engine, then it was well worth the investment. We stripped it down. It took several months just to get everything off of the airplane, and then we started the ground up restoration of the airplane. The more we got into the plane, the more we realized that it was a lot more extensive than what we thought. All the hydraulics needed to be redone, all the flight controls needed to be redone, the landing gear needed to be pulled and tested. I mean, it was just a monumental thing. But a little by little, we did it. When you get started with something like that, and you've accomplished so much, and you see another issue, what do you do? Well, you keep going, because at some point, you've got to get through it. And that's what we did. The Avengers restoration began in 2004. After more than 10 years and thousands of man hours of restoration, it was time for the first flight. Well, of course, everybody's nervous. Now, we've got a lot of years in this thing, and we don't really know how it's going to react once we really put the pressure on it. All of us are lined up out by the runway, and I know everybody had white knuckles. I know they did, because you could feel the tension in the air. I can only imagine what the pilot was feeling. <laughs> the first day is, there's nothing like it. It's, a, it's an exciting day, because it's, it's not something I have had experience in before. I do have a lot of tailwheel time in other warbirds, but nothing in the, in the Avenger. So it's a cross between a little bit of fear, anxiety, because you're, you're like, well, it's an older airplane, and inherently it's, you know, old parts. When you start pouring the power to this, and it's an extremely big motor, very torquey motor, so it is so much noise, and it's loud, and the plane starts shaking, and the canopy's moving, and it is just different sounds and vibrations than you're used to. The tail comes up for the takeoff, and once you start lifting off, it is, I don't know, it's the most exhilarating feeling because you just, you, you don't know how it's gonna fly. When it left the ground, everybody just kind of a little sigh of relief, but then everybody's watching it as it circles. The plan is we're going to make one round around the airport and we're going to land the airplane, and then we're going to look it over. It's an interesting plane to fly. There's not many flying anymore, so compared to other aircraft, extremely heavy. Heavy ailerons, heavy flying, big motor, lots of power to carry a lot of bombs and accessories during World War II. Not overly maneuverable, it was a point and shoot type airplane. Slow at rolling, slow at, at turning left and right, slow at climbing, but it's a dream to fly. A bit heavier on landing than you would think. Very nice landing airplane also. Everybody is white knuckled until we hear it go chirp chirp when it hits the ground and it's a sigh of relief. You've got everybody's reputation, you've got a guy's life in your hands, and he thinks that you're good enough, or he, he relies on you enough that he was willing to take the airplane up. So yeah, it's an emotional deal. The Valiant Air Command's TBM Avenger is currently undergoing more testing, engine work, and flight time before it can fly long distances to air shows. With even more time and money demanded to repair this war relic, the question has to be why? Why put all this work and money into this aircraft? Because of what it is. The airplanes that we choose to have at the museum need to have historical certificates. That's what we do. This particular plane was one of the, one of the planes that actually turned the war in the Pacific. George Bush Sr. flew one of the planes very much like this one, and he was shot down and ended up ditching in the South Pacific. Flight 19 was a flight where five Navy TBM uh, Avengers were lost in the Atlantic Ocean. So it was an obvious choice for us. This is the one we need to, to work with. When the plane starts, the sound of the engines, the smoke, it's just all part of it. That's why we do it.
Central Florida boasts of several attractions that feature exotic animals, but perhaps none duplicates a true safari experience better than this small ranch in Lakeland. Less than an hour's drive from downtown Orlando, Safari Wilderness Ranch is the brainchild of Charles Salisbury. I worked in zoos in England, Australia, and this country for about 35 years. Zoos do a terrific job of educating a lot of people, and they do it where people live, which is in cities. But for herd animals especially, it's a compromise. There, it, there's not enough room for herd animals. Part of my job, I would take people on safaris to oh, okay. Africa. And in going to Africa, I realized that the Africans are light years ahead of us in terms of how they manage captive animals. Safari Wilderness Ranch is an attempt to replicate that African experience. What you guys are seeing here, now look at these, this looks like Jurassic Park, doesn't it? Look at those <laughs> ostrich come to us. That is a living dinosaur. That is a close. This has been a very fun project, and it's been pretty much based on taking an old man and cattle farm and then getting rid of the cattle and introducing species that do well in these ecotypes that we have here. You go out in with the animals, and the animals are not in individual areas, they're in amongst each other, like you would see in nature. In a big vista, you'll see 30 species, and you drive around for a couple of hours, and it's a really much more realistic kind of invigorating educational fun thing than you can get going into an inner city zoo. What you're seeing here is something called flight distance. If you get too close to these guys they move off and you'll never see this in a zoo because there's just not enough room. Look at that. Salisbury believes that when guests experience not just the sights and sounds of animals but the smell and feel they take home more than memories. When you go out and you feed a water buffalo and it slobbers all over your hand, it just burns into your brain, especially if you're a little kid. My favorite part was the water buffalo because I've never seen those. I just love feeding animals. It's my favorite thing to do. The lemurs that you go in with here and interact with are ring-tailed lemurs. We feed them grapes and they will put their little hands out and grab your hand and to pull the grape into their mouth. And when they do this, it feels like a little human baby grabbing your hand. And so that is another emotional experience which you commit to memory. <laughs> so this is a, a different way of going on safari. You can go by camelback and camels have been taking people on their backs for about 6,000 years and they really actually enjoy this as part of their day. When you come out on safari and you have a nature experience like this, this you're recharged and you go bus. back okay. and do whatever yeah, you yeah, are doing better, I think. I did not expect that we would be able to touch these animals and feed them. Usually you think of a safari wilderness experience and you just think that you're just driving through. I love animals, so it was really cool to get to see some from Africa and Asia and actually get to touch and pet them. And the camel ride was super fun. And ultimately, this place is as much about the animals as it is about people. Animals need homes and we've been taking away animals' homes for a very long time. I just hope that a safari experience like this can inspire people to do whatever they choose to do in a sort of more thoughtful way and to, and to kind of consider animals when they're thinking about things. Thank you.